one. Uh, good morning. On behalf of RDIC, our team, which consists of Gord Heidel, the director, Renette Edgar, Troy Wist, which is out of uh, Moose Jaw, and myself, Doug Stamen, we'd like to welcome Dr. Marilyn Stamen from Lakewood Animal Hospital. As well, we have Brandon Wu from Strategy Labs helping us out with this uh, live event this morning. Marilyn's here this morning to discuss veterinary medicine. She'll touch on educational requirements, specific therapies used in her practice, opportunities in the field and salary expectations. A reminder again, before we begin, please complete the survey by using the QR code or go to our website, rdic.ca. Uh, we'll be making a draw for $50 gift certificate at the, uh, on December 15th for the people who have completed the survey. So without further ado, uh, Marilyn, take it away. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and it's, uh, to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Marilyn Stamen. We're here at uh, Lakewood Animal Hospital here in Regina. Um, it's uh, an interesting and um, unique opportunity for us to uh, show you through the clinic and uh, give you an idea of what goes on here you know, on a daily basis. Um, we have a big clinic with eight veterinarians uh, uh, that are um, that are employed as well as uh, eight technologists. We've got um, six what are called veterinary assistants. We have um, uh, six receptionists. So it's a busy place and there's lots going on. So what I'm going to do is to uh, first spend a few minutes just giving you a little bit of a background, a little bit of an idea, you know, of how you can um, how you can uh, get going into a career in veterinary medicine and uh, some inf information on that aspect and then we will head out into the clinic and give you a real bird's eye view of what's happening um, uh, what's happening this morning so we are um i say it, we employ eight veterinarians and eight tech veterinary technologists um we'll be speaking uh, primarily about the veterinary uh, medicine uh, aspect of, of a career in that um, but there is also uh, the opportunity for veterinary technology, which is like um, uh, somewhat like nursing in the human field. And so if you're interested in that aspect um, of, of our work, um, there'd be information you know, available um, for that at a later, at a later time. So as far as the veterinary side, uh, veterinarians uh, are required to go to university. And uh, there's a two-year uh, prerequisite requirement um, that involves uh, taking all the same uh, prerequisites that you would take if you're going into other medical fields, including, you know, uh, include, including for a physician. Um, it is possible to take those prerequisites in a two-year uh, time frame and apply to a veterinary college. Um, but, and I, I use the word but, um, very strongly, it is very, very unusual for students to be uh, admitted to a veterinary college with only two years of uh, pre veterinary science. And I don't want anyone to feel discouraged about that because it's a quite a challenging career and challenging um, uh, education process. And having an extra you know, year or two or three under your belt only makes you a little stronger student in veterinary college, a little bit uh, more um, of a background in the sciences and you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's never a negative thing. And most students need to complete a full degree before, they, before they're admitted to the veterinary college. Having said that, um, there's nothing wrong with applying. You know, applying even the first opportunity that you have when you have all your prerequisites apply because they will give you feedback on um, what is needed and what to work towards, you know, to, um, to continue um, your, your goal towards being accepted. So once you've completed, um, uh, you know, the prerequisites or, you know, degree or um, wherever you are at that point, um, the application goes to, um, to Saskatoon. Uh, in Saskatchewan, you're very lucky students because Saskatchewan has the Western College of Veterinary Medicine, you know, in Saskatoon. Um, there is a college in Calgary um, that's fairly new, but they accept Alberta residents. Um, there is a college in Guelph, Ontario, and one in uh, Charlottetown, PEI, as well. But 
in Saskatchewan, I say we're very fortunate to have the college here. Um, it, uh, it allows an opportunity for Saskatchewan students and there are 20 students admitted, you know, each year, you know, into the college. You, you go to school in your class with um, students from you know, Manitoba, so some from Alberta and, and BC, and then sometimes international students as well. So once you're in the veterinary college, uh, it's a four-year degree program, and it is, um, again, very similar to, you know, human medicine. Um, you're learning um, all aspects of medicine um, and surgery and um, management and such there's there's a lot um, a lot of a big scope you know to uh, to the education uh, but once you graduate uh, as a veterinarian uh, you are qualified to um, work on uh, work in, in multiple varied fields it's a degree uh, that is well respected uh, in the community um, many, most veterinarians work in a, a practice setting, you know, such as what we're seeing here this morning. But there are um, uh, veterinarians that are in, you know, other types of practices, whether it's specialty practices. Uh, I had one colleague who actually went into exotic medicine. All she looks after is little birds and, uh, and hamsters and, and guinea pigs. Um, there are other veterinarians who work focus primarily on, um, you know, on on, on pig medicine or um, mixed practice with large and small animals. There's also veterinarians who work in government, uh, working to manage disease. You know, there's uh, there's veterinarians that are employed in government to um, to try and protect the health of livestock and animals coming across the border um, and you know from from to and from you know other countries. There's um, also veterinarians working in industry in um, technology, developing um, new uh, techniques for veterinary science and veterinary medicine, as well as even for um, uh, it also in the in the pharmaceutical you know aspect as well. So there's uh, there's a, a wide scope and there's veterinarians working in many many different fields. Um, so in our practice, we have as I say eight veterinarians. Um, we have a little bit of a unique um, setting here because about 20 years ago, I decided to um, explore learning and, and uh, education in more of a holistic approach to veterinary medicine. And I started out with, with homeopathy as my uh, focus. And as the years have progressed, I've um, taken a very big interest in um, a bit of a more of an integrative approach to, uh, to practice. I do a lot of work with uh, nutritional support, um, and and now even into um, you know minimizing toxins and having a more whole you know naturopathic integrative type of approach to practice. And so um, as a result of that, um, it spurred some interest in uh, my colleagues and one uh, who does chiropractic treatment. Um, uh, one of our associates that also does acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Um, and then we, of course, do have uh, veterinarians who are, uh, are um, specialists in doing things like ultrasound. Um, one of our surgeons here, Dr. Jen Johnston, um, she's a, a really skilled uh, veterinary surgeon who is, um, it will show you uh, doing some surgery this morning. So um, there's a lot of, uh, well, the veterinarians here, as they each have a little bit of a, their own focus that helps to complement, you know, we complement each other and we're able to refer back and forth, which is really, really interesting and makes it really fun. Um, as far as, um, as uh, opportunities for work, um, there's a shortage of veterinarians. Um, there are, there's a very big need for veterinarians. Uh, we have an ad out right now for a veterinarian and, and it's, um, there's, um, there is a, there is a shortage of them. Uh, obviously you guys in high school, it's going to take a while for you to, to be able to apply here, but, um, but it is a, a, a profession that is, uh, that is needed and, and growing. And, um, and when you graduate, uh, at this time, uh, graduates are generally starting, starting salary of about $80,000 a year. Um, veterinarians generally make um, just so you're aware, they generally make less than other medical professions such as dentists or 
um, or physician. Um, there is, um, I say that about eighty thousand dollars to start, then go up to maybe hundred, hundred and twenty um, with more experience. Um, there are veterinarians um, such as myself who have, have we're lucky enough to have an opportunity to become a business owner, and so I invested money in this practice. 35 years ago and uh, and became a partner. Um, I have my business partner here, Dr. Don Powers, and the two of us own the practice. So we have a, the privilege and the challenge and the um, uh, the headaches, uh, but also the benefits of being able to have control over the direction the clinic has, but also how it's run and uh, as an investment um, as far as uh, enhancing um, income, you know, uh, versus working as a strictly salary person. Um, now I'm thinking what we'll do, uh, and we're now looking at, I think it's time to get out into the clinic. You guys are going to get uh, much more interesting information by doing that. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to head down the stairs and we're going to see how uh, Dr. Skipic is doing. Uh, she's doing a dental procedure. Um, uh, on a little sky terrier. So let's head there now. Coming through the reception area here and the receptionists are working hard to answer phones and make appointments and do a lot of work. Can you show tell? <laughs> okay, what's had given us some anesthetic concerns a few years ago, but we're doing really good today. So we're very happy with it. And I'm just going to gently click on this piece of So um, our technologist here, this when I was mentioning about being uh, some of the professionals that work with us, um, technologists are, are um, a very integral part of, of our work. We couldn't function without them. Um, and uh, Ashley is, is helping uh, look at, she's basically monitoring and ensuring that our uh, patient is stable under anesthetic. We have, um, she uh, right now isn't, isn't all covered up and with a heated blanket because Ashley is monitoring her body temperature. And if she starts getting too cool, there's a machine that will, or she can wrap him up and blow up in, uh, in uh, like a little, heated pocket kind of thing that will uh, really help them to settle in. We've got the intravenous fluid running in. Uh, we've got a monitor here, uh, the, the pump that's pumping in, in the, the IV fluid. Um, we have a, a monitors on that are keeping track of blood pressure, oxygen levels, and uh, she's monitoring the heart rate and, and tracking, tracking through the course of the anesthetic that the little one is very stable and, uh, and managing, you know, under anesthetic. This is the anesthetic machine here, and there's the oxygen comes from um, upstairs. There's a cut tank up there and comes through the wall, or it comes out through an oxygen line uh, to the anesthetic machine. And over here, the um, the oxygen is being pumped in through the machine. And this is what's called the vaporizer, and it takes the anesthetic agent from a liquid form into a gas form, and it mixes with the oxygen, comes out through the line here, and goes right into um, a little one, uh, uh, through an endotracheal tube down through the, the uh, trachea down into her lungs, so that um, 
she's taking in that anesthetic and maintaining and maintaining uh, himself under anesthetic. Before they come, but when they come in in the morning, they are checked, and examined, and then sedated with the medication. And right now, now Jenny, so she's just going to be taking out a few years, so she's just working on loosening that. <laughs> what uh, the one that Dr. Skipik is working on is actually, um, you know, they're very, di very. Um, Difficulty in you know, removing, but there are some many teeth in the dog's mouth that um, are very challenging. They have three roots to them. They have very very deep roots and can be um, can be like say quite a challenge to to extract. So um, I'll show you over here as well. Um, and our technologist here is working. She's doing um, uh, some analysis on the on the microscope. She's our lab technician today. And so she's working on, she's got the, the smear right there up on the screen. These are uh, all the, this is, she's looking at a smear of blood. blood. And Ashley, what are you seeing? Uh, so I'm seeing red blood cells, I'm seeing white blood cells, seeing platelets. Um, so I'll go through and I'll do a count um, to see kind of what white blood cells they have, what the red blood cells look like. Um, make sure that they have an adequate amount of platelets, um, just to make sure that everything's looking uh, good. Uh, this one is pre-surgical, so just to make sure that everything is uh, looking good before we put the patient under anesthetic. That's going on, and then we've got here, this is the um, x-ray of, of um, the little one who's under anesthetic right now, having his teeth, his teeth extracted. These are x-rays that were taken before, um, before the dental procedure started, and we see these are just several of the teeth. Um, we've got nice healthy roots here. This is why Dr. Skiffick has decided that she's only needing to take out, um, extract only three teeth because overall they're looking quite healthy. Here, I'll show you some other ones. Um, I'll show you some of the roots. This is the, this is the, the big canine teeth. This is the part of the tooth that's actually sticking out of the mouth. That's how big that root is deep into the jawbone when you have carnivores who are evolved to chew and tear apart their prey, um, they really need very strong, you know, strong rooted teeth in order to accomplish that tearing action. So that's you know, the big tooth here, and this is little ones that are alongside it. <clears throat> uh, see, some other ones here. This is uh, the roots of the little incisors. It's it maybe hard to see, but these are all the different roots here. Um, looking up here, this is all the, so we look, go through and we x-ray all of the teeth so that we can, um, so that we can assess, you know, their health uh, beyond what is visible, you know, above the gum line. And um, it's, it's a little different than what dental hygienists do at the dentist office because they are, um, the dog's mouths and cat's mouths are so variable in size that it, it's a, such a variable to how many are actually needed to x-ray each animal. There's a lot of, um, some animals take 20 x-rays and some are okay with 15 and some need more than that. So it's, uh, it can be quite a challenge and that's where skilled professionals like Ashley here is, uh, are really great at doing those and <laughs> get those x-rays done. Okay. So you're doing okay there, Dr. Skipik? Mm -hmm. All right, okay, so I think we'll head upstairs um, see what's going on up there now. So we can take a look at Dr. Strachey again. We have six exam rooms and they're all busy with uh, doctors seeing appointments, like this one, little guys that are coming and going with all kinds of needs and struggles and troubles. Yes, I do. Okay. 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 Okay.
coordinate all the appointments coming in and out. Is everything okay there? Okay, great. Come on in. Okay, this is um, the big treatment area. We have um, multiple stations where we can be working to take lab tests, uh, do different uh, different procedures. Um, and here, uh, another technologist we're in is getting this little guy started to go under anesthetic. Um, he's going to be neutered or oh this little guy has some bladder stone issues and so he's going to have some bladder surgery and so uh ren is working on getting a catheter in so that we can uh, start to get this little guy under full at general anesthetic um if we come over here we've got dr johnston at work and uh here she's in surgery and what are you up to uh, so we got the anesthetic machine again, the same procedures down in the dental, all the monitors uh, keeping an eye on, but standard technologist uh, monitoring uh, while uh, Dr. Johnson is doing surgery. And um, maybe if you have a moment, Dr. Johnson, you can show what you took out of this dog <laughs> once you have that done. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. No, I can of my dog this is emma she's our little special girl she has no eyes she lost both her eyes last year because she had glaucoma and stuff but she's very happy and she's a lovely girl <laughs> she's quite the special child and uh, we're going to x-ray her back because as she's getting a little older she is um uh getting a little bit sore and tending to kind of do a little bit more uh scratching at herself and so i want to see if there's any indication that she has a little arthritis in her back so Loren and Hannah have really uh, protected themselves with lead, lead uh, gowns and thyroid protectors and uh, such. And we'll have to leave the room as soon as they're ready to take the x-ray. But um, we're getting her ready to, to do that. And as soon as we're ready here, we'll have to pop out so we can stand out here. And you can kind of take and take it from here if you like. Yeah, we're far enough out this way. So yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So we take multiple, we take multiple views or you know different pictures from different angles so that we can get uh, more of a CD look at you know, what her back looks like versus uh, just taking one picture. So was that the last one? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So all three are there. Okay. So um, I'm having a little trouble getting the ID in. This is live, and so we have sometimes some of the little guys just like in a person. It can be difficult sometimes to get um, get an ID, so I'll let you know. Sometimes it doesn't work the first time, so um, or it doesn't doesn't cut out. Sometimes little veins aren't as healthy as as we'd like. I won't cause more stress for Zene. <laughs> well, this come this way, and we'll look at some X-rays here. This little guy had a had a little tumor in me, so he's just waiting. 
and resting and uh, you're okay. Oh, Emma's happy now to be, be finished her x-ray. <laughs> okay, come this way, I'll show you some x-rays here. So it's nice with digital x-rays, we have the ability to uh, to look at them right away and then we actually also can email them to a radiologist. Veterinarians are it's really a neat job because we are jack of all trades. We we are not we're GPs just like a human doctor, but we are actually um, we have to be a little bit skilled at almost everything from being a radiologist to an anesthesiologist to surgeon, internal medicine specialist. Um, um, anyways, there's lots lots of to that. So here we have this is my Emma. Um, this is her X-rays. So when we're looking, I'm looking at her back, um, especially and looking to see if there's any hint of arthritis uh, going on here. Um, a little bit of changes here. I'll see it in a second. But this is this is her back. This is the diaphragm, and you've got her chest here with her heart and lungs, and then this is her abdomen, you know, liver and, and stomach and all that. Um, so we're going to look here at a few different views. So each vertebrae is looking, it needs to be really nice and smooth and even. Um, and here we can see there's a little bit of more, a little bit more of a, of a what's that called? It's called exostosis or a little bit more of a, a bridging that's happening. Not severe, I'm not too unhappy with this with my Emma. Um, it can be a lot worse. You can actually have little bridges actually form between the vertebrae that really start to cause some dysfunction and sore and sore back. This is looking from her, um, looking when we look, the picture that you saw the girls taking is this one. So we now look straight through the back and we can see that the, all the little vertebrae, there's nice normal space in between. But if you can see there's, a space here that's this size. This is a little bit narrower and this is a little bit wider again. So I think she does have a little bit of older age changes happening in her back, uh, but not really severe. There's another view here. Okay, so these are all the different pictures. So if I was unsure of, um, of what I was seeing or what I was concerned about, then we would email these to the radiologist to, um, to give us more information, more specialized information. Um, and uh, I'm just going to look. Okay, so this is um, this is the guy. Yeah. Okay, so here's when we look at um, uh, the dog who is just you're watching the dog trying to go under anesthetic and getting the IV going. Um, let me just see. I'll zoom back out again a little bit there. Okay, so here's this is the dog. We've got this is the back and then the tail. This is the pelvis and then the two hind legs coming down here. And um, this is actually a bone. Dogs have a bone in their penis. So this is the, the male dog. We have a bone here. This is part of the problem because this dog has, this is the little guy's bladder, urinary bladder. And in that bladder, we see these little densities here. These are, um, these are little stones that are in that bladder. And even though they look small, they can be enough to when they go to pass through the urethra and out through the penis because they have a stone in their penis or sorry a bone in their penis they can get blocked where they can't urinate because the stone blocks the opening and you end up in, in spasm and a lot of pain and discomfort so going in through the belly here going into the bladder taking those stones out flushing this all out will help that dog um, here we also see this is the colon there's the stool the dog you know right here is stool in the colon and then this is the intestinal tract here um oh sorry ah. Ah. this is this along here um this organ is the spleen and i'll show you again maybe i can show you on emma i'll show you some more things on emma here um but she they took they focused in so we can't really see as much let me see here um, so here, um, when we have the, the diaphragm here, and this is the, the liver is right behind here, and then 
<laughs> this is this is interesting because Emma um, just ate breakfast about an hour ago, and I've been actually learning to feed. Uh, I feed my dogs very, you know, non-processed food, uh, raw throws. This is uh, raw raw pulled food. Also had a few blackberries this morning and. Um, a little bit of our green smoothie, it would have kale and spinach, a lot of very, very healthy food. And I've been feeding my dogs uh, actually once a day. So they get a huge, huge meal once a day. Well, this is Emma's stomach. She's actually here. She's got this stomach, it's all going all the way. <laughs> she is full to the nines with all the food that I fed her this morning. Um, very happy and very content and she'll be fine now till tomorrow. Um, you only do this, I made, need to make sure you tell you, you cannot do this if you're feeding your dog dry, you know, uh, dehydrated, uh, kibbled food. This can only be if you're feeding non-processed food that they, that they will be able to, to do this. That would be disastrous. Do not do this unless you know what you're doing. Don't, don't make that decision uh, without talking to the veterinarian. Um, but uh, for Emma, like say, she's got that nice full stomach and then there's the rest of the intestinal tract here. This is her one kidney, uh, just a little rounded thing here. That's her kidney there. Um, and as, as she's getting older in her chest, we can see her lungs, like they start to become a little bit more scarred. The lungs start to have um, um, not quite as, as uh, there's a little bit more density to the airways. And so uh, we can see that with Emma. Uh, this is her trachea coming down from her neck and from her throat. And then that what's called bifurcating to the, uh, the lung. And this is, her, this is her heart here, just the top of her heart. There. Okay. So, um, Dr. Powers, you're headed into another appointment. <laughs> just give me what I need yeah. to head yeah. in. Yeah. Okay. And now we'll see if they've got, um, how this how this going if they've got that IV going in that uh, in the little dog for the dog is coming to me The guy who is crying when you come back here, he's um, just waking up from the anesthetic and so sometimes they're a little vocal. Uh, he'll be medicated with further if he gets so upset. So sometimes they are like that when they just start waking up. I guess it happens in people too and then uh, if he doesn't settle down right away, then he's going to be uh, given some more medication to settle him down. So we'll come through here. So we've got uh, technologists are always successful in the end. They're very skilled people, and uh, so they've got the IV uh, into this little guy. And now Ran is just putting place the tracheal tube down into the into the airway so that we can hook him up to the anesthetic machine and get him ready to, to go into surgery. Naomi is actually uh, taking her, she's, uh, she's been working with us for how many years now? Uh, four or five. And she, and she decided to take the plans and what are you doing now? I am doing an online program through Boston University to become a vet tech. So then I can be doing what she's doing instead of what I've done. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, come on in here. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Stupid is our ultrasound uh, guru. Uh, she's taken a lot of extra training, and she is she is very helpful at at, uh, at, at um, doing ultrasound and diagnosing all kinds of problems. So, okay, I'll let you take it, Jenny. What are you seeing? So this dog is vomiting for the last three days. Uh, young dog. We're always worried about a foreign body or something stuck in the gut. So I'm just looking at the intestines to make sure I don't see anything that's obvious for an obstruction. So this is a bit of intestine right there. That looks fairly normal. So I just scan through, trying to catch pieces of gut. I'm worried about a foreign body. Oh, here's a nice, this is intestine right here. So she's panting. But this is intestine. This is the middle. This is the different layers. So that's what a dog intestine looks like. And I'm just seeing if there's any fluid backing up in it. And there's not. So I don't think this dog has a foreign body, which is good news for her. So this is all intestine right there. This is her colon. So that's actually 
gas and feces right there. Normally I'm a little closer to the dog, but she's upset. Mm -hmm. She's got a lot of cat in here. Oh, here's the, this is bladder right here. So big black circle, that's urine sitting there. Not what I'm looking for right now. But again, right now I'm not worried about her. I, these are beautiful intestines. Nothing going on in them. Yeah. Well, the dog, even though it's been super vomiting, you know, Jenny, she's, oh, no, it doesn't look like a foreign body. So we're probably use the medication to help settle her stomach okay. down. And uh, and know that she's not you know uh, in real trouble right now. Yeah. That she should be able to turn around and start feeling better. Um, doesn't look like she needs to be hospitalized. But who is it? Your patient, Jenny? Or? Yeah, it yeah. is. Oh yeah. Okay. She's good otherwise. Okay, so she's not going to enough stay in hospital. She just had a good little look here, and now she'll head home with the medication and uh, and be okay. Oh, that's right. Here. Help out. Okay, good. And so now what they're doing over here is uh, Duran is now prepping for surgery. So getting this little guy already. Uh, obviously, you have to cut all the hair away, um, and then she'll do a full scrub uh, to um, there, you know cleanse that area that the incision is going to be made in and then once she's all set with that then we transfer it into surgery and uh, let the dog can go into that bladder and get those stones out and flush that through and help uh, him feel better again. So yes, Naomi, uh, like they decided to take her um, her vet tech program. It's really wonderful. It's just it's been a few years now that it's been available where you can take the program online. There's lots of options, isn't there, Naomi? Oh, uh, there's there's a few now that I know of. Um, there's the one I'm doing, and then I think there might be a couple in Alberta, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. So over the next year, she gets a clinical experience and uh, gets to start developing skills um, in you know what she's going to need to be doing and then she takes uh, classes on the side and all of her exams you know online and stuff so it's uh, it's really great. Loren you went to Google. You went to Anyway our technologists uh, have come from multiple varied schools and uh, Let's say a really huge, huge part of what we do. We couldn't function without them. Emily, you're right there. Emily is uh, right now. She's taking uh, pre-veterinary classes at uh, U of R, and uh, so she's. How, where are you at with your schooling? I was going to general science classes for the first few years, and then you apply and hopefully get in and move up from there. Yeah, no, that's great. All the best. All the best for sure. What are you doing here? Dr. Skip. I'm going to help out Dr. Johnson. She has a lot of surgery, so I'm just going to need her to speak out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, things going for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. You can bring him down this way. You can put him in the, if you want to come this way, you can see. You can watch the little guy get metered there. That's right. So he's been obviously sedated. He doesn't just lie there like that. <laughs> so for cat neuters, we have very good, um, really neat uh, medications now that are given by uh, injection, and they um, they uh, control the pain and as well uh, help him to be um, able to have surgery without necessarily having. We always used to have to have them all under general anesthetic same procedure as what you're seeing over there, but um, with um, the new medications now, we don't have to do that. And Janae is, now she's, she's giving um, like a freezing agent to block into the testicle so that um, it adds extra 
um, pain relief support and, and make sure that the poor guy is very comfortable before before they're before he's actually needed. Coming from this side, are you? I come from whatever you what's that? I like to be here. Yeah, okay. If you can see okay, Brown, or you can go around the other side, whatever. Yeah. So low reaction on my first head. So we get the testicle out. Very small, this little guy. Uh, the testicles loosened up. This is the spermatic cord right here, this white part. So I actually use that and I'm going to tie the blood vessel and the cord together. And I just do this uh, four, five, six times. This way we cut off the blood supply. And when I cut the testicle off, it won't bleed. Five knots in there, that's good. I'll just cut the testicle off. And I'll do that for the other side as well. And it's a little tough, I could say. Well, I'd like to get the out. Um, it comes in the last. Well, you Just loosen everything up and tie it to a thread. That is it. It's weird. And we don't sew it up. It's just such a small little hole. And I only make one incision and that will heal all by itself. And tomorrow he's not even gonna realize anything happened. We'll send him home with some pain medication and he'll be back to normal. And that's it. So now you just gonna make sure he's okay now. Okay. So we're going to see the whole guy so that yeah, it's getting tight right now. I have two more things to take care of. Oh, you do? Okay, all right. So we'll go down and check on all the dental. Um, Dr. Skipic, we're like, they all help me out all the time. She, um, as you know, she was the one taking that tooth out, and then she takes tooth out, and then she's called up to help us doing an extra surgery. And um, Lindsay or Ashley's still going down uh, doing uh, dental scaling and, and working on that little guy. Um, and then she'll come back down and do more extractions and uh, Lots of stuff going on all day long here. Thank you. 
big one too here. Um, but the teeth are still pretty stable, so mm -hmm. Dr. Susan didn't want to take them. Mm -hmm. um, so basically what I did was just root plane um, mm -hmm. the teeth there. Yep. So. Just clean them all up so that they're nice and nice and clean. Uh, there's a little bit of blood there and stuff, but really it's, they're looking looking very nice. And so yeah, it's nice professional cleaning so that the the teeth that are remaining are going to try and stay as healthy as possible there. And those guys still nice and stable on an anesthetic. That's good. That's great. I constantly monitor to make sure that they're doing well. You see, it got, got a little bit colder, so suddenly so says a blanket on little one, and if they get colder still, like say you turn on the, the heating pockets and uh, yeah. keep them nice and warm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, maybe we can um, head back up to the uh, office. Actually, there might be one here. I'll just check and see. Ronnie, is there an IP uh, gathering down here? Yes, yeah. there. Uh, five and six. Okay. okay, let's head in here and we can maybe see if there's any questions. So um, I hope that was interesting and, and helpful uh, to see the kinds of things. I mean, each day is very different. There's um, no two days that are the same. And beyond what you saw, there's veterinarians in the exam rooms that are dealing with very sick animals, animals that are sadly sometimes in palliative care situations where they're having to decide when to when to consider letting their, letting their pet go and, and euthanize them. Um, there's guys coming, puppies coming in for, you know, checkups to, to see if they're uh, needing any help or uh, planning for their care and, uh, and preventing troubles, you know, and getting vaccinated appropriately. Um, I think as, as a veterinarian, I've, I've very much enjoyed my career. I still am here after over 35 years but I do know that there is a lot of stress. Um, my younger colleagues are um, do find it very challenging. There's a lot of pressure from the public to um, do a very good job and to uh, and to care for their pets um, very professionally. And and uh, it can be it can be daunting sometimes because obviously we aren't able to help every animal and uh, some. Situations go better than others, and so there's there's definitely need for ability to communicate well, ability to empathize, uh, ability to also let go. You know, when we have made an error, or whether we feel we've made an error, or even if we haven't made an error, but still lose a patient, it it can be very it can be very challenging. You know, um, emotionally as well. Um, the veterinary profession is sadly known as one that is um, becoming more. Um, a victim of you know uh, mental health distress uh, so we're hoping that over the course of the next years um, we'll all get uh, even better at managing that and, and finding tools and ways to um, to cope with um, with the stresses of, of the career um, so I'd like to open it up if there are any questions um, is there anything that anybody would like to ask That was such an awesome tour, Marilyn. I I can't even begin to think of how the, some of the questions that I have for you because you've you've done a, an awesome job presenting, you know, the whole clinic overview of, um, you know, what happens in a in the life and time of a, or life and the day of a of a vet and vet tech and assistant. Um, great, thank you. Yeah, if there are any any specific, I guess I, one question I, I'm wondering about is the actual schooling at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, so, are you seeing definitely a, a need for more vets? Um, is the college able to accommodate the interest or the potential for students even to have jobs after they come out? There's not a problem with any of the graduates. There's generally about 60, 65. Uh, students in a class. So about that many graduate from WCVM. I'm not exactly sure how many uh, in Calgary 
as well. And then of course, you know, other parts of Canada. But um, I think there's a number of uh, reasons for uh, the, um, the difficulty right now not finding, you know, enough veterinarians to work. I think there is some um, sad correlation between um, and cause and effect between the, the stress of the of the job. Um, some some veterinarians at different different um, facilities are pushed to work uh, beyond you know a normal you know, forty hour work week. Uh, some are you know on call regularly. Some are um, are pushed to have appointments every you know ten to fifteen minutes. Um, and, and so there's a lot of veterinarians who are deciding to go, you know, one part time or trying to, to cope with some of that. Um, at any rate, there's, there's not really a uh, will at this point to increase the number or the size of the classes. Um, at the college level, it's very expensive to put students through um, the, the, um, through the program. And there is only so many, you know, um, only so much money, you know, for that. Um, so we don't know. I mean, when I graduated, it wasn't like that. It's only been in the last probably, I'd say five years that this uh, shortage has really come into play. Um, and they're still brainstorming on, you know, strategies across the country, really, as to what to do, you know, about that, about that situation. Um, of course, sadly, there's also a very, very, very difficult situation in rural Saskatchewan because veterinarians working in rural settings um, are not as fortunate as we are in the city. They are responsible for their um, patients on, you know, um, an emergency basis, you know, basically every day of the week. Um, they have to travel, you know, to farms, uh, you know, very long distances. Um, and, and generally some of them are making, you know, 80 to $90,000 a year. And there's a lot of um, pushback from, I think, the next generation saying, well, Maybe this isn't, you know, the direction I would like to go with my career, and and so there's more interest in a little bit more of a, you know, a city uh, work where you can actually control your work life a little bit more. Um, so I do think that there is part of that as well. There's been a shortage in the large animal world for a long time, um, and it's hard to know exactly where we'll end up, you know, in say 20 to 50 years, whether there will be a veterinarian that will be able to travel out to farms and and deal with an individual, you know, um, sick animal. Um, it, it, it's like say it's difficult to say, you know, exactly where the future, um, what the future will hold. So there is um, so the different ways to get into the veterinary college. I know you can get in through the College of Agriculture through the University of Saskatchewan, and I think one of your gals is going just through uh, the pre-vet through the University of Regina. Is there one way that's better or or more successful to get into the college? Uh, that's, a really good, that's a really good question, Annette. Um, no, I have to say, no, there isn't. Um, I had one of our really wonderful pre-veterinary students who actually did a business degree first. Then she decided she wanted to do vet med, so she did a prerequisite. And then she uh, worked with us here at our clinic, and we gave her reference. And she still did take two tries to get in, but she did, and now she has a beautiful background because she has the science and the, and the business side. Um, there are certainly uh, many that go through the agriculture in Saskatoon. And I think that there is, um, there is even a, um, there is some value obviously in that. There's some new classes and some new um, degree focus at the U of S uh, for um, even the small animal side, dealing with uh, dogs and cats, a little bit more of the physiology and that versus U of R isn't able to offer those kind of specific courses. Um, I took my uh, pre-vet in Regina. A lot of people I know, even Dr. Powers, my partner, the same thing in Regina. Um, but of course, my colleagues come from, you know, uh, you know, one of them was in, went to school in Brandon, one went to school um, in Calgary. There's, uh, I would not say that they, you know, Starting in Regina, if, if you're from Regina, is not going to be a, um, a negative for you. Um, do go where you need to, when you have where you have to support, where you can get your classes in, and then uh, and then work from there. If you are close to Saskatoon and, and you 
would like to go there or that is something that you're interested in, by all means, uh, there is some value to that. But I wouldn't say that they necessarily have, you know, a tremendous head, you know, um, leg up, you know, uh, versus somebody that's coming from, say, Regina. Thank you, Marilyn. There's a question from uh, from our our audience saying our participation. Um, this get, um, student is saying, I heard there's lots of vet burnout. Um, how do you know if you can be a vet? How do, how do you deal with animal loss? Um, I think the burn. That's a very good question. I think the burnout is um, is beyond. It goes beyond the loss of pets. Um, I do think uh, what I found personally is that having more of a spiritual um, aspect to life has helped me a lot because I really do, I, I'm, I'm okay with letting little guys go. I feel that um, they have a spirit in my heart and uh, when their body is really troubled and they're really struggling, that it's a gift that we can offer. And it's a, it's a very beautiful thing to be able to support a family through losing their special little friend uh, in that way. So I can cope with that quite well. And, and most of my colleagues, I think, to some degree can. Now, having said that, everybody is different. Um, but a huge source of stress in the veterinary profession is, comes from um, the expectations you know, from the public. Um, a lot of times there's uh, criticism or stress on the side of the family when they bring their animal in, they're stressed because their animal is sick. They're stressed because they know it's going to cost money and it, it is a, a, a very difficult thing for them to cope sometimes with the budget, with their budget and with the cost of veterinary care. Um, and so instead of trying to work through that, sometimes the veterinarians get um, accused of just being money grubbing or accused of, of not caring or, or are, basically the stress that the people are feeling is kind of dumped onto the veterinarian and um, and it, 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 can be, it can be really difficult to, to navigate that, um, especially for the younger veterinarians. Now, how do we, that's just kind of one aspect that came to, my, came to my mind when the question came up. But I think that the big thing is that, how do we, how do we become veterinarians that are very um, able to enjoy the profession and see the value in it and give of themselves and yet not be depleted, uh, I think comes from um, a plan right from high school, right from youngsterhood on. Look after yourself, know how to balance your school and, and the goals that you have with your own self and your own life. You get exercise, eat very healthy, get lots of sleep, do not stay up all night studying, get some sleep. I was always the one at the uh, university level, at vet college level, my roommates would stay up till all hours. I said, I'd be going to bed at 10 o'clock saying, I, I go to bed, I can't do anymore. Um, I seem to get through, you know, just like they did. And I think a little bit in a little bit healthier way. So the skills that we're all learning, I think as society uh, is how to cope with stresses, learn, you know, to meditate, do some yoga, do some exercise, take breaks um, and look after yourself. Then I think that I, I do believe that it is a profession, just like almost any other, that you can navigate through very successfully and, and really gain so much from it. The relationship I have with clients that I've looked after for 30 years is just, I could never have had this, um, this type of life without my profession. Uh, all the little creatures that I've looked after, generation after generation, had to say goodbye, but also have said a lot of hellos to really beautiful little puppies and kittens that come in the door. And if we learn to balance that and, and kind of look at life from a little bit wider perspective, um, that I think will be really crucial. Also, there's a lot of recognition in our profession now of the situation. And so there's more and more resources coming all the time. But for the high school students, go to school, try to just enjoy every day, work very, very hard in school and do your best. And then give it, just be patient with yourself and work your way through, you know, the university years. Uh, try not to be nervous every moment. Oh my God, this one exam, this one, you know, one assignment is going to be the be all and end all. And by the time you're finished all the schooling, if you've come through it in a way that is balanced, um, you will also be able to handle the profession in a balanced way as well. 
That's an awesome response, Marilyn. I think time work balance is so important, especially for students coming through high school now. You know, then you attach the whole pandemic, right? And and dealing with that and you know how university will look for them and 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 I guess there's really no guarantee that any career is real for them. But I think having an opportunity to watch you and this this filming of your clinic, I think is a really good indication to students just what they can expect and and um, you know how they deal with with this particular um, you know career as well too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if there was any more questions from um, from our office here. Um, if the students are okay with that, I'm just going to give them another couple of seconds here just to either unmute themselves or to maybe just write it into the chat line quickly. Um, but um, yes, I, I do you ever allow students, I know it's tough with COVID right now, but to come on site or come and um, shadow, uh, you know, in a time that maybe there was less restrictions to help a student maybe decide if this truly was their calling? Yes, I, I, uh, we uh, at our, our practice feel very strongly that we want to support students and help them to have, you know, an educated, make an educated decision. So we actually, the, 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 uh, the vetting technologist program requires, they have 60, I think 60 hours of, of exposure to the profession. And so um, they need to come in to the clinic to do that. So we often have students scheduled, they have to be scheduled and, and can come in for a, a span of time. Sometimes it's for a few weeks, you know, for each morning, uh, sometimes it's once a week. Um, and then we have also had um, high school university students, like I introduced you to Emily, who's a university student. She had done a little volunteering for us and then she, um, and then she applied and she's working half time while she's going to school. Um, we can only accommodate, you know, so many, but yes, we do uh, have students come. Sometimes it's only for a morning. They get to see kind of what you guys have seen uh, this morning online, uh, but, um, but we try to accommodate you know when we can so if anyone has um you know a wish to do that they would need to you know drop out or send a resume and um and uh, request for that and then we would you know see what we can do with COVID again we have to you know as you can see we are all very we have to work very closely here at the clinic for the nature of our work and at the same time be very cautious and safe you know with with the pandemic so it may not be feasible or possible um, to do that in the next little while, but certainly down the road, um, we could get back to our, uh, our regular, um, you know, uh, having students into the clinic a little bit more regularly. Awesome, thank you for that response. Okay, I think we're just going to, uh, to close it off and Doug is going to just do a little uh, conclusion here. Okay. Uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Steeman, for your informative presentation. Uh, I thought it was just awesome to help the students with their quest to make a better choice about their future employment opportunities. And again, thank you, Brandon, uh, for helping out videoing it. And uh, thank you very much.